All right, I think we'll get started. So uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Ian Gregg uh, from CA Cert here. And um, if, you, if you know anything about SSL, um, you probably know that SSL is a little bit of an elaborate scam to, uh, which consists of taking people's money and selling them numbers, right? Now, to be fair, the, the, the certificate authorities do some verifications um, of your identity when you buy an SSL cert. Uh, or so we thought before the EFF released the findings from their SSL observatory, where um, they found, for example, that quite a few people around the world have a valid cert for 127.0.0.1. So maybe it's not all that great. Um, but anyway, CSRT is a, is a grassroots uh, response to uh, the SSL cert business. Now, uh, CSRT believes that anybody should be able to afford SSL certificates, not just people who happen to live in rich countries that can afford to buy expensive numbers. So anyways, that's um, a little bit of my rant. But um, please help me uh, welcome Ian. Greg. Uh, thanks, and uh, it's good to be here. Uh, this is nominally supposed to be an Assura training event, a training event for Assurers, which we're going to do in the next session. The next session was too short for that event, so we've sliced out some parts and put it into this session, which means this session is more like a, an open introduction. It's talking about things that um, are general, and that means I'm going to talk about stuff that I'm interested in, if you want to hear something, then you probably need to stick up your hands and ask. Um, I'd like to say thanks to Francois for this, and also a big thanks to the, uh, the Linux people for actually having managed to get their disaster recovery plan to work. Um, I would ask, did they have a disaster recovery plan beforehand, or did they invent it on the fly? Um, either way, they got there. That's me. I'm Ian Grigg, uh, commonly known as Ian G. Uh, I'm on various teams, but the most important ones that we're talking about today are assurance, audit, and board. This is a rough agenda for this part. Uh, two things I would like to talk about, SSL everywhere and client certificates. And then finally, a bit about CA Cert and where we fit into things. And then the later afternoon session is this Assure training event, which starts out with CA Cert and how it got affected by the audit process and then goes on to the assurance side, what you as an assurer need to know. Um, and we won't cover that area this time, but it'll be in the next session. How many people here are actually assurers? About one. How many people know about CA Cert and are part of it? OK. Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. OK. So this talk here. Right. Da, da, da. As you can see, I've cobbled these slides together from a different set of uh, areas. Oh, uh, damn, wrong one. Slideshow, there we go. Okay, SSL everywhere. I just put this together in the uh, half hour or so before this, so it's uh, the first time it's ever been seen. Um, what are we trying to do with SSL certificates? Uh, we're trying to get SSL to protect stuff, but um, what tended to happen over the last 10 years, it started in 2001, actually. By 2003, it was proven. And that's this thing called phishing. And while phishing was arising, another thing started happening, lots of breaches and so forth. Um, the response to this, to my mind, consists of three things that we can do. Uh, HTTPS Everywhere is a, a new label which has been brought out by the EFF people. Client certificates are something that can help there, and so can CA Cert. So that's what these, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this HTTPS Everywhere thing. Um, what went wrong? This is the very much the helicopter view. This is not the technical view. In phishing, the attacker manages to convince Alice to go to the wrong website. How he does that is another issue, but he's actually managed to do that, so let's start from that point. At that point, the browser is supposed to tell Alice that she's on the wrong website, or she's on the right website, or whatever. She, the browser is supposed to tell her that, but the browser didn't tell her that. So what went wrong? Well, it turns out that um, there's a big problem with the browser. It runs two protocols, HTTP and HTTPS. 
HTTP, the basic clear text stuff, doesn't say anything at all. It doesn't warn, it doesn't do security at that level at all. And also HTTPS doesn't really say enough to be able to stop this happening. Why is all this? Well, we, we can look back in history, and it's a lot of history. We're going back to 1994 when the web really started up. Netscape was the big thing at the time. Um, and there were a set of browser wars going on, firstly with Mosaic, and then moving on to Microsoft coming in. A lot of stuff was going on then. Uh, one of the responses was the SSL development, which had problems right from the start because they adopted a threat model, which is probably inappropriate for various reasons. Uh, all of this got caught up in a real estate war on the browser. Uh, you've probably come across the padlock. Uh, how many people here know that the padlock is going to disappear? A few. Yes. Uh, after 15 years, the padlock is now deprecated in Mozilla. Uh, Things are moving on. Then there's the whole CA business. How the CA started up is an interesting story in itself. The PKI concept is part of it. Special interests. We've all heard of the conspiracy theories, no doubt. And, 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 and. Um, if you go into the history, you, you end up getting the feeling that too much was going on and you really can't unravel why SSL and browsers are as they are. But we can look at the market and we can say, what's going on here? Well, it's quite simple. HTTP is overused. It's used everywhere for almost everything. And HTTPS isn't used that much at all. It's literally underused. And now we can, from our helicopter, look at the result of this. And that is if all of the traffic, more or less, statistically speaking, or 99% or however you measure it, if that's all HTTP, and if a tiny portion of the traffic is HTTPS, that's the protected stuff, then the attack will always be the same. It will be to downgrade from HTTPS to HTTP. And that's what phishing is. It simply downgrades from one method to the other, and the other just happens to have no warnings. So to address that, what we need is more HTTPS. We need more security, more SSL. Um, at the least, what we want is a whole lot more. Instead of 1%, we want something like 10%. And at 10%, things start to happen. People start to respond. People t start to learn about it. So why didn't that happen? Why don't we have HTTPS everywhere? Uh, it was originally meant to be everywhere. But when it first came out, speed was an issue. As soon as you turned on HTTPS, you lost about a factor of 10 on performance. But that was back in 1995. Now, in 2010, we've got laptops that are fast, we've got servers that are fast, most of them are sitting there doing nothing. The effect of switching to HTTPS is not very strong. So we don't have to worry about speed anymore. Another factor was that there was a bug in SSL. Now I say it's a bug, although nobody much agrees with me. Um, the problem was that you need one IP number for one SSL connection to one site, which became a problem because fairly soon after the website started up, everybody went to virtual hosting across one IP number, which worked fine, but you couldn't do it with SSL. All of your Apache, uh, HTTP, Ds, and so forth are all set up to run multiple websites over one IP number, and they can't do SSL over that. There is now, however, a fix for this bug. Um, it's called TLS SNI. SNI is uh, server name indication. It's in HTTPD Apache now. Question is, has it got to the Linux distros? I'm not quite sure on that. Um, the third reason is that certs are complicated and expensive. You had to buy them, and when you did buy them, they were messy to install. They weren't like other things. They weren't like good startup situations where you download the software, you get it up and going, and away you go. Certs are complicated. And this is where CS Cert comes in. We try to deliver free certs. That's one of those two issues they're sold. Now, what can you do right now? Um, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm speaking to the Linux community. Linux run just about all the web servers in the world by statistical basis. Um, because you're all doing virtual servers, you can all make a big difference by looking for this TLS SNI server name indication patch. It's shipping in the HTTPD. 
I'm not sure. How many, does anybody know how many distros are actually shipping with TLS SNI yet? Nobody. How can you tell? Can you tell? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the bug got fixed, or it got distributed out of HTTPD about one to two years ago. It was 10 years coming, that particular bug. Um, okay, what you can do is look for that, get it running on your Linux servers, switch all of your virtual servers across to SSL, across using, sharing your one IP number, and that way we build up the number of SSL websites. Why, why am I saying this? The thing is that we're missing out on a whole lot of security because we have so few HTTPS websites, the downgrade attack is very easy. Nobody notices when the attacker manages to switch you across to HTTP. The solution to that is to get more HTTPS, more SSL out there. Once we've got more people out there, more SSL out there, people get more familiar with it, and it also puts more pressure on the browser people to work on the user interface. There are a lot of good user interface ideas out there, but unfortunately, they've all been downgraded because not many people are using SSL. The browsers are not that interested in this problem. Um, the other thing is that it isn't going to affect, th this change isn't going to come through from the big institutions, the banks and so forth, which care about SSL and so forth, aren't going to do anything about it. What's going to happen is once the TLS SNI starts to filter through, once the grassroots Linux people can start to do virtual SSL sites, the experience will build up and the demand will build up from, in, from the lower side. And then that experience will bounce up, will move up the tree to the high end areas, such as the banks that do need the protection. Okay. That's my, um, if you like, my personal rant on why we need more HTTPS. Uh, does anybody want to challenge me on that? Yeah. I'm actually got a question instead. Um, TLSS and I, does that require any support for the browser end to actually... Does it require...? The browsers to be able to support something. Yes, yes, but all the browsers have supported it for years. Um, I mean, I think there's like one browser in one version that doesn't support it or something like that. Sorry? IE6 doesn't. IE6 doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's always this chicken and egg problem. Yeah, there's always some laggard. But as far as the browser world is concerned, we're waiting for Apache. Um, I'm not sure whether IEE has it, but I guess that's not interesting to this audience. Right. Yes. Um, I think because the browsers have it, once, Apache, once the Apache websites start to use it, the, the push will come through that way. If this was put up and yeah. done, uh, they probably wouldn't be able to see, uh, they, they wouldn't be able to understand the certificate, so they'd probably have to click through. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing, is it? They should be upgrading. Okay. So what else can we do? Um, we can do client certs. Now, this is kind of a, a self-interested thing because CA cert delivers client certs and it can do and there's no problems. We come up to the other problems a bit later. Uh, client certificates are a funny beast. They, they address an authentication problem. Authentication, this whole idea of knowing who you're dealing with, um, it, it went through a whole bunch of phases, which I sort of put some numbers on there, right in the beginning of the internet. This is probably pre-web times. Everybody was using email and so forth, and everybody was more or less trusted on the internet. And that didn't last very long. But then somebody came up with the idea of passwords and usernames, and that went for a while. Then the whole web thing started up, and web, once the web started up, the internet became for the masses, uh, at that stage, we got to the idea of single sign-on. This was the, uh, the stuff people were talking about in the late uh, 1990s. And then in the early 2000s, people were talking about federation and so forth. This whole authentication thing goes on. There's, there's other things going on now. Um, what is it? Identica and OpenID and things like that. Um, 
what kind of went wrong? Well, if you don't have something, then uh, there are too many people on the net, and some of those people are untrusted. Passwords have a problem with complexity. Uh, if you've got too many sites, and you've got people crunching passwords, you need passwords which are too long. So you've got this n times m problem. And then once that happens, once you've got each person having too many, too much complex uh, passwords, you get into this security and support problem. Too many people losing their passwords. Um, the problem with SSO and federation was more or less this uh, situation of technology versus sites. Uh, everybody had to have a method, every site had to have a method, and you ended up with a lack of a widespread adoption. Uh, there was also the issue with uh, who's got your data. Uh, it was a bit scary because a lot of people were talking about federation from the point of view of one trusted party looking after your data, but who really believes that? Um, and even the businesses were starting to get a little bit scared about that because they were seeing their customer data lent out to other people, and that's something that does scare businesses. Businesses do care about privacy. As long as they're in control, they're very happy, but if somebody else has got their customer data, that's the worst thing that can happen to them. Um, so the thing is, why don't we have computers and technologies and protocols to do this? Well, we already do. It's called client certificates, and um, if you look at it from a sort of information theoretic point of view, public-private keys are like extremely complicated passwords which are tied one for one with big numbers. They are, and from a technical point of view, they can replace passwords quite easily. There's another great advantage to them. Uh, every browser and every web server has this code in. Unlike some of the other technologies that we've, talked, uh, we've heard about, all of these buzzwords that you hear about, this stuff is already in there. It's been in there for a long time. So why didn't they work out? Well, it wasn't because of the software. Uh, it wasn't so much because the data was at risk or the customers were at risk. It was, again, this chicken and egg problem. Every person needed a certificate, and every site needed to switch on the certificate, the client certificate access. Um, which meant that every site would look at the people who had client certificates and almost nobody has them. And every user would look at client certificates and say, oh, but none of the sites require it. You've got this chicken and egg problem. Can I interject here as well? Every time you upgraded your browser, it threw all your client certs away. Yeah. Because there wasn't enough demand for the product, the browser programmers weren't putting enough effort into the working of the software. And the end result is that the, uh, the interfaces are quite buggy. There's a lot of difficulties there. So this is kind of a story about how CA Cert got into the business of solving this accidentally. Um, certificates, they're supposed to be about identity, and they're supposed to be about assurance. They're supposed to mean something. And the way the CA business has evolved, not through grand thought or strategy, but through accidental circumstances, CAs check your identity, and then they can issue a certificate. Now, we ended up in CA Cert with something like, at the time, uh, 10,000 assurers around the world, mostly concentrated in Europe. CA Cert, um, just as a digression, which comes in a bit later, I guess, CA Cert was started in Australia. However, it wasn't particularly successful in Australia in terms of numbers. Initially, it was quite successful, but it moved to Europe, and we have a very strong base in Europe. Um, these, these assurers that are all, all the way around the world uh, needed to be audited. They needed, to, and audit said they needed to be tested. They needed to, be, to meet a minimum standard. So what happened was we at CO Cert sat down and thought about this and said, OK, we'll create an online test. We'll do a simple, basic test, which we called CSERT Automatic Testing System. And we said, OK, a bunch of multiple choice questions. Every assurer must go through this. And we're talking about 10,000 people there. Um, and at that point, we also had a, an inspiration. How do we know who is an assurer and whether you are an assurer? Well, we said, OK, you've got to have a client certificate from CSERT. Why did we do that? Well, a bunch of reasons could be 
put forward, because we're a CA, um, it's so cool to do so. Uh, we wanted our assurers to know about certs, client certs. Yeah, that's a good reason. Um, actually, we kind of did it because we had the feeling that this was the way to go. The CAT system only accepts client certificates. You can't get into there with usernames and passwords and so forth. So as an assurer, you've got to go get your client certificate, go into CATS, do your 25 multiple choice questions, and then you can pass the challenge and be an assurer. Um, it worked. It worked. It went live in uh, early 2008. Uh, it was obligatory in 2009, which meant that you couldn't be an assurer without this. When it started, we had 10,000 or so of these assurers, and immediately it dropped down to zero by the fact that nobody had done the challenge. Very quickly, it came up into the low hundreds and climbed and climbed. Today, or as of last night, I checked it, it's 4,136. That's people around the world who've connected in and passed their assurance challenge. And um, the thing there is that the, the end result is we are a lot stronger because we have this test or this objective test of what these people can do, what they know, and so forth. So it worked out as a big process for us. But it also meant they all know about client certificates. They all have a client certificate. We now can make the statement, every one of our assurers has a client certificate. Which means that um, we can now move across to all of our websites, and that's what we've been doing, and turn them all onto client certificate access. We can throw away our usernames and passwords. And this is what we've been doing. We've migrated so far the WordPress, the SIMPA, uh, the, the mailing lists, a voting tool. Uh, there's a bunch of other things such as uh, surveys and testing. Um, it's, it's basically something that's on the sysadmin work list and has been for the last year or two to move every system across to client cert results. Now, what has this meant? For the blog, it's fairly, uh, it's fairly clear. Um, if you've got a certificate, you can get right access to our blog. You don't need to ask anybody. You don't need to get permission. We've got a blog that speaks out to this entire community there. Um, and we don't have to worry about spam. Because to be a spammer, you'd have to go and join the association, uh, join the community, get your client certificate, and then start accessing the, uh, the blog. It's too much work for a spammer. And so consequently, we've now got a situation where uh, we've lost, we, we don't worry about lost accounts anymore. People just go and get another client certificate. We don't have to worry about passwords being lost. So our administrator, who's generally bogged down doing this sort of administration, is now doing other things. It's released that person onto other work. And there's also no more arguments about who is allowed to access the blog. Who's allowed to write a post? Who's allowed to speak to the user community? Everybody's allowed. Everybody can get into our blog and write a post. And it's a fairly middle ranking, reasonably ranked um, blog with a lot of links. So we end up having a lot more authors and a lot more users writing their posts. This has been sort of duplicated across the other sites where we've used client certificates. Uh, once you get over the hump of getting everybody to have client certificates, you get more productivity. But there are a bunch of gotchas, a bunch of problems. Um, firstly, as uh, the gentleman down the, the bottom here said, there are problems. Uh, the Firefox, for example, gets confused about multiple certificates. So if you've got two, three, four, five certificates in your uh, web browser, Firefox isn't so good at deciding which certificate to use in which uh, place. And basically what we're doing here is we're waiting for the guys over in uh, the Firefox team to add whitelisting, to add an ability to record which certificate goes to which, um, which place. That's, that's one issue. The second issue is that um, you get a bunch of crazy messages. And the root of this is if the Apache is somewhat misconfigured, and that's a very broad term, and it doesn't like your certificate for some reason or other, it will treat it as a security problem and dump the SSL connection. So what then happens is the browser sees an SSL protocol error. Instead of saying, oh, your certificate isn't quite right, we need you to go and get it renewed, or you need to 
the certificate from another vendor or something like that, it gives the user a protocol error. And the user really isn't equipped to be able to deal with any of these random errors which are popped up. Um, this is just an artifact, having looked at both sides of the argument, it's an artifact of not enough demand for the product. Once client certificates are in more u widespread use and once people have had more arguments, the developers on both sides will get together and start agreeing how to deal with these strange client certificates. We just need more user complaints. That's my view there. Um, the next thing is how do you actually use these things? There's several strategies. You might find yourself using passwords and client certificates as well. And this is going to happen if your user base is already using passwords and you're adding client certificates. Um, uh, the problem with this is a bit too much like the existing problems with HTTP. Uh, you've got an attack between the gap. You've got a downgrade, if you like, a downgrade attack. If you've got multiple methods, you will always have problems. Um, also, you're always coding around the edge. You're always trying to code around the best way to move between passwords and client certificates. It's more work. So you're better off going for uh, client certificates only. Or as it says there, only do that if you have to. Um, for example, uh, the CA cert main website does take passwords because everybody's got a password. We won't be able to switch that off for a long time. The second strategy is to only use client certs. That's the only way you do it. And this, in, a, in essence, amounts to outsourcing your password problem to the CA uh, so, uh, client certificate vendor. Now, here we find a bunch of questions. Uh, firstly, Apache, uh, there's, there's several ways to do this. You can do, you can do the processing within Apache using the various uh, config files and so forth. The problem with Apache is that it's got quite a complicated way of arranging its client certificates. And this is mingled in with a, a complicated way of dealing with its directories and various other permissions. So the end result is Apache does like too little or too much. It's, it's always a bit messy. The alternative is to put all of the processing in your application. And this is good if you've got control of your application, which is to say if you're doing your PHP programming, then you can do all the processing yourself to be able to deal with it. So what you do is you turn your uh, Apache into transparent mode, which is easy enough. It just ships the information up from Apache as the client certificate comes in. You get this bunch of variables telling you precisely what the client certificate is about. And then in PHP or whatever language it is, you can read off this information and make your assessment. That works out to be better, because there you can get much more control about what you're doing. You've just got to write some code. If you're installing some other application, however, like one of the ones straight off the web, um, it's, it's a bit harder, because that's already written. Um, the third gotcha is that certificates can and do change. Every year or two, people get a new cert. And this is where it becomes very valuable to do your own coding with client certificates. Um, you can read the certificate straight into a database. That's a good idea. Uh, once you've got that certificate, you extract out the information you need, which is primarily the username and the email address. And as the new certificates come in, the first time you see a certificate, it's unfamiliar. It's not found in your database of certificates. But you can match on the name. You can match on the email address. Now, as long as the person carries on using the same name, the same email address, you have essentially a capability to swap from client certificate to client certificate. And it becomes a fairly seamless, painless user experience. If the user goes and changes their name or their email address, uh, or both, then you need a, a bit more thinking, a bit more intervention at the sysadmin level. Um, just to conclude, the client certificates do work, and they do work very well. Uh, we've been using them for a couple of years. They've solved a lot of problems. They reduce the complexity. They save us a lot of administration headaches. Um, are there other methods? Yes, there's OpenID. Client certificates using uh, SSL are a higher security solution. Uh, the problem with other solutions, such as OpenID, there's also um, uh, open auth, is it? Um, et cetera, et cetera. You still have to get that deployed widely enough into the code bases, into the applications, and so forth. 
So client certificates have the ability that they're already there, the benefit, they're already there. All you have to do is start configuring them and getting your users to use them. Um, how do you get your users to use them? Well, one way you can do it is simply instruct all your users to join CA Cert and get a client certificate. That's what I've done at one of my uh, institutions that I was uh, working with, where we had a bunch of system administrators. We simply told them, okay, from now on, you're all part of CA Cert as a system administrator. You get your certificate, and then in you go into the various applications. You can do that if it's small. Um, if you start off with a new site, then you can use the certificates to pull people in. That's helpful. Or alternatively, you can build a, an internal factory uh, CA, which distributes the certificates straight out of the website to the users. Okay. Well, that's the end of that. Okay. Question. Why can we going to use it? Um, so how do you deal with... Uh, Portability. If you do use client certs as as your auth method for your site, like how do you log in from someone else's browser or, or an internet cafe or whatever um, when you're not yeah. using your laptop? You can't really do that. Um, client certificates are for the user who's basically using their own machine um, and their own browser. I have a little bit of a difficulty wondering how you can secure access in a net cafe when somebody else owns the machine and theoretically cleans it up. So I, it's one of these areas where it's kind of difficult. Can you really make that work? I don't know. But yes, portability is not a, a, not a good answer. The answer is, is that it's branched to the corporate amount of security that you have in an internet cafe. You're longer around content if you have a secure login. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and we will see this issue in the future, as more and more smartphones get more and more browsers um, using that sort of access material, to an extent, we spent the last 10 years securing our laptops. And now we're going to start the whole game again with smartphones. And smartphones are going to be hit by viruses and various other problems. And they're going to be a way behind the laptops or the, uh, the desktops. So it's an ongoing issue. You can kind of see it as a battle of attacker versus defender. Okay. No. Third part of this has disappeared. Bear with me while I go searching for the third part of this talk. is one of your other proposed solutions. It's a total mess because everybody's got their own protocol. Uh, it, it, it could be. Um, to be honest, I don't know very much about OpenID. Uh, I think on their own admission, they indicate that it's a fairly medium to low security solution. It's more a single sign-on thing which gets you up and going, which is good, which is good. Uh, there is... Uh, a system called Identica, I think it's called, which converts certificates into OpenID, which allows you to use your certificate, go to um, set up your OpenID hooks or however it works, and then you can go and use any OpenID system. There's a couple of OpenID providers that the way OpenID works is you have to log into the OpenID provider, and there's a couple of them the way you log into the client search. Yes, yes. Which is a good hybrid. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Does CSR offer that? Does CSR offer that? It's interesting. It's already there. Identica is, is doing it. Um, and and CSR has got a little bit of a dilemma there because as soon as we start talking about it, people will say, oh, CSR approves of this. And we don't know who is doing it. We don't know the people behind Identica. We've tried to find out, but they're not responding. So we're, we're trying to be quiet about it because we just don't want to scare anybody away.
there's a few around, yeah. So, that's our experience. We ask people and they say, no, not us. Okay. Here we go. Right. Slideshow. Finally, CA cert. Um, now you're all, most of the people here are new to CA cert, and we don't have a good presentation for that sort of thing. But this is what I've cobbled up. Um, CA cert is a certificate authority, certification authority. Now, the problem with these beasts is that they have all this power to issue certificates to people. And supposedly these certificates are good for something. Supposedly we can rely on the certificates, which means they're kind of scary. And the way the browser world has responded to this, this kind of scary situation, is that they require every CA to get audited. CA cert has not got an audit. So it's not currently in any of the browsers. So consequently, um, back in 2005, they started the process of getting audited. And the last five years have been the history of CA cert getting audited. And it has been a five year story. So a lot of our documentation starts from that point. Um, who we are, we are a community CA, which is to say you join, you're in the community. We are all volunteers. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, 4,000 plus plus assurers, people who are checking the various identity aspects. Um, strongly based in Europe, uh, especially Germany. Um, a lot of people, over 800 in the USA, and a smattering across South America, and a few across all the various other places. It started in Sydney um, to do with wireless networking in Sydney and quickly spread across Australia and then out to the rest of the world. However, we have the problem that uh, we're very underrepresented in Australia. Our association, uh, which runs the, uh, which is, if you like, the executive part, has something like three Australian members amongst 60 worldwide members, and we need Australian membership. Hence, I'm here also banging the drum to try and build up our Australian membership to get a bit more balance into the, the whole community. Um, we are challenged by this audit process. We have to get the audit to get into the browsers, and this has caused a big lot of changes, a lump of changes across the way it works. The first audit um, went into high gear in 2009. It hit an immediate difficulty in that the executive, the board, and the various managers didn't have the capacity to respond to the auditor's requests. Now, when I say that, I'm, I'm being a little bit deceptive. I was the auditor, and I requested various things from CO Cert, and they weren't able to respond. Um, the, the deeper reason was that the community itself had been encouraged by previous boards and presidents and so forth to not worry about things, to be patient, and wait because somebody's doing the audit. And this didn't really work out because everybody sat in their asses and did nothing. So consequently, we've been going through a big rethinking process of trying to push all the work out from the center, which wasn't doing anything, out to the community, which are capable of doing things. We have a very big community. We have a lot of good people. And if we can bring them in and start working on these various issues, we can get them done. So, the last year, two years, was about getting that message out. And we've more or less done that. So I need to update these slides. Um, the community has the capacity for doing the audit. Um, so that's part one, change the message. Two, build up the capacity. This is what we have been doing. Um, and I'm going to run through the list of teams here. These slides are more or less internal marketing. Um, and five, engage the auditor for the next two audits. All right, let's, let's talk about CA Cert from the vertical point of view, which is to say, if you're at the side, you can see three vertical areas in a business sense. We have these areas. One is the assurance, and this is in PKI terms. It's the registration authority. They call it the RA. And this is the 4,000 assurers that are out there across the world doing these verifications. 
Then there's the systems, and this is the classical certification authority. It just issues the certificates according to the information that comes from the previous group, the assurance. And then there's the community, which is the larger body. Um, and these are the people who have certificates, who rely on certificates. Um, if you join CA Cert as a community member, you will be part of the community. That group is estimated about 20,000 people. Um, we don't have hard numbers on that because it's too easy to create an account and get a certificate. Consequently, we have uh, something like, I think it's 100,000 accounts, and most of them haven't been touched for a long time. My estimate there is about 20,000 people in the community. Um, so in terms of the teams, uh, we, we have a, a group of people doing business operations and these are essentially the sort of managerial functions you will see in your workplace that aren't technical. A big group doing policy. We have something like 20 people uh, monitoring the policy groups to create the documentation. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about that. CASA is different to most open source organizations. I, I suspect we're kind of unique. I, I only know of one organization that comes close. And that is... Because we are required to get an audit, we are required to have business-like processes. Specifically, audit works like this. It's, um, we do what we say, and we say what we do. That's a kind of mantra that comes from the audit world. We do what we say, and we say what we do. Which means we have to say everything that we're doing, which means we need documentation, and serious documentation that can be tested. And this is kind of novel. In most of the open source world, the code is the documentation. The code tells you what's going to happen, and people just dive in and change the code where they, where they want to, where they can. So CSRT has had to take all of its processes and dump them into documentation, and this has been a four-year effort which is now complete. Um, then there's teams for the assurance side. We have an events team which runs around and does these ATEs. So today I'm here as part of the events team doing this particular event. Uh, there is an education team which prepares the challenges. That's the, uh, the Assurer Challenge. We also have a support challenge coming up and uh, various other initiatives around the place. We have organization assurers. There are about 10 or 15 organization assurers, and that's to really deal with companies and so forth. Um, dispute resolution is something that is um, a newer area for CA Cert. We have something like 10 arbitrators around the world listed who can rule on the various disputes. Um, I'll say a bit more about that. They're supported by case managers. Those were all business aspects, which are fairly standard across business. And now we get to the technical side. In the technical side, we've got teams for triage and support engineers. Software is uh, a little bit of a black mark for us, but we do have now a good testing team. We have development of the PHP code, and we also have software assessment. Um, and these are controlled areas. Uh, for systems administration, we have several groups doing this. Um, so the takeaway from all that is we have a lot of teams. But all of those teams have something in common these days. And that is, you need a little bit of familiarity with CA Cert. So um, you need to have spent a little bit of time. Uh, you need to be an assurer these days. And that's because we require a certain amount of reliability, which then gets fed up to the audit process. Um, and assurer, the, the role of assurer, is where we can put that stake. We can put that label on saying, this person's reliable. Everybody tends to help with recruiting and training. Um, but more than other organizations, we also need a little bit of attention to detail. And the detail here is we have a bunch of policies, and you have to follow them. Uh, we have practices. And when things go wrong, we have a formal process for resolving issues, which is to say we have a thing called arbitration, which allows us to resolve difficulties in a quasi-legal fashion. Okay. So now I'm just going to run through the various teams that are out there. Um, senior assurers uh, help and run these ATEs. That's what I'm going to be doing this afternoon. Um, and basically help around the place. 
blah, 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 blah. Okay, not to worry about that. Okay, policy group. Policy group is very interesting because it's open, but we set firm rules. We create policies, and the policies are written and approved through a democratic or voting process. They then become binding on every member of the community. So if you've joined, if you've just signed up at the website, you may suddenly find that you're bound by certain documents. And these documents are created in an open web, uh, in an open mail list. Um, so anybody can join and practice this part. And to an extent, the policy group is like our legislature. It's like our parliament. Um, organization assurers, they're basically just very good with assurance and they know more about companies and so forth. Arbitrators, um, another big difference with CO Cert, which I will cover in some depth in the ATE process, in the ATE section later on, we have a formal method of resolving disputes. And I'll just say a little bit about that. Um, certificates are supposed to be important. They're supposed to secure things. They're supposed to be reliable. We are supposed to be able to use these certificates for all sorts of important things like online banking, like uh, security and so forth. Um, well, what happens if something goes wrong? If something goes wrong, somebody's out of money, somebody's out of pocket, some damage is done. How do we resolve that situation? The classical answer is you go to the courts and you sue somebody. Now, CA Cert, for one reason or another, which I kind of get into in the, the next section, has chosen to not go to the courts. Instead, it's brought it all in and created its own arbitration forum, which is to say its own legal way of resolving disputes based on a thing called the Arbitration Act in every country. So we have something like 10 people around the world who are listed as arbitrators. They will hear a case and deliver a ruling which is legally binding and which can, if it's done well and uh, if there's no problems with it, it can be taken into a court and respected by that court. So that gives us an answer as to how we resolve disputes. So these people are very important to us because they're actually making changes to the way we work and they can do so in a quite solid, legally binding fashion. Uh, case managers um, support the arbitrators. Uh, generally, the way it's worked, which wasn't intended, the arbitrators will work in uh, buddy pairs. One of them will be the case manager, the other will be the arbitrator. The next case, they'll swap around. Triage are support people. They're the front line. Basically, what they do is they see this, the incoming support traffic, and they quickly direct it to one of several locations. So they're able to dive into web apps and follow the staff and get a few and quickly direct it around. Um, it's the starting place for a lot of things because it gives you a good familiarity with what's going on. Which leads us to the critical roles. Um, because we are dealing with privacy information and because we're dealing with these certificates which are powerful and they're audited and so forth, uh, we require people who have powerful access, the root uh, system administrators, as it were, in a conceptual sense, to be checked out. And uh, roles that come under our security policy require a background check, which is called ABC. It's called that because the arbitrators run the background check. They're an independent voice over the various recruiting activities of the team leader. The team leader has to propose somebody, and the, um, the board has to finally approve. So. Support engineers are put through this process because they do have the power to adjust people's accounts. Um, software. We have a situation with software. We have two bodies of software, one of which is new and hardly started, the other of which is the old uh, running software, and that's PHP. Requires a lot of patience to deal with it because it wasn't written in a good fashion to start off with. Um, to, to support this, we have a bunch of uh, people working as testers and software assessors. Uh, infrastructure team, these are the people who manage all the other systems, not the CA itself. Uh, access engineers are people located in the Netherlands, in uh, AD. 
which is a little town which has a very secure data center. They will control system administrators going in there, be present for every access, and they are the physical line of protection. Uh, the critical system administrators, these are your classic system administrators running the CA itself. Um, they always work with other people, there's always four eyes. Audit team, I'll leave that. All right. uh, I'll leave that. CSERT Incorporated. Um, this is the association that owns the legal part of CSERT. It's a New South Wales association of members. We've got about 60 people on the books, we're always adding more. It's very easy to get in. There's not very much to do in CSERT Inc. Um, unless you're on the board, in which case there's a little bit to do. Uh, it's the counterparty to every other person, and that's the, the 20,000 active people around the world. Um, so it's quite important, and it also acts as the final deciding point. Uh, there's seven members normally on the committee. Uh, we appoint various roles and we oversee things. We also implement the policies, which is, is curious because we have outsourced the control of policies to somewhere else. As an institution, as a, an association, we are bound by a group of people that are outside the association. So uh, from a governance perspective, this is the helicopter view, we actually have three heads of power, three central areas which are very powerful in and of themselves. The policy group, that open group, can create binding policy. The arbitration people can deliver the rulings in any dispute, and they can knock policies down. And the board is supposed to implement those policies and also follow the arbitration rulings. But the board itself also appoints people who are arbitrators. So we end up with this three-legged stool, which actually mirrors the classical Western democracy thing of the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. And this has worked very well for us. We've had a number of bun fights between these various groups. And at the end of the day, everybody said, OK, you've got your power. You can beat us on that point. We'll beat you on another point. Ah, let's all sit down and work it out. None of these groups has been able to achieve supremacy. So what are we up to? Um, building these teams. The last annual report showed us something like 40 people who were consistently permanently involved in the situation, in, in CA CERT. Um, tom, 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 tom. And another message for our internal team, what can we do for the audit? Okay, that brings me to the end of that ad hoc description of CA CERT. And questions? Um, Web Trust is the starting point for a lot of audit processes for browsers. We are actually under a much fiercer regime called uh, DRC for David Ross criteria. This is part of the next talk. Um, David Ross took the Web Trust audit criteria and rewrote it. He took their um, 25 points and expanded it out to 150 points. And he also rejigged it completely. And um, if you like, Web Trust is focused to keeping the CAs in business. And David Ross rewrote it such that it addressed the user's interests. So it's a very different process. It more or less covers the entirety of Web Trust, but a lot more as well. And that extra part is what makes CA Cert different. Yes. I mean, that is basically our, our um, strategy, if you like. We do issue those certificates to businesses. Uh, they're of limited use because of the, the problem with not being in the browsers. Uh, we have been basically working to get into the browsers and get the audit process done for the last five years or so. It's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot more work than open source groups really anticipate or understand. So, yeah. last question before the, before the afternoon tea.
after that, that you can come back and it'll be the sure training event. I was just going to ask, just from a very general perspective, what does an Ashura actually do? And is this next session intended that any of us become an Ashura? I, I just don't really, not really aware of what uh, the next session entails entirely. Yeah, what does an Ashura do? And is the next session intended to make all of you Ashuras? Uh, it's a cautious yes, in the sense that certainly, please turn up, learn how to be an Ashura. It's oriented towards people who are already Ashuras and need to upgrade their skills over the last few years worth of big changes. Um, but practically speaking, you will find out what it takes to be an Ashura. Uh, what, and then to prejudge that or to predict that talk, what does it take to be an Ashura? Uh, you have to help verify the identity and a bunch of other points of each person you come across. You create a piece of paper, documentary evidence for that, enter the points into the system, and that way you add confidence to our web of trust. In, and our web of trust is intended to provide a statement over every member of the community. And assurers collect the information for that, if that makes sense. From a, a, a totally non-official um, point of view, it's, it's kind of like um, the GPG web of, tr of trust, except that one big difference is that the, you download a form from the CSO website, that's what you fill out, and you keep that form for seven years. That's the main, the main difference. Yeah. But it is, it is essentially the same thing, like checking someone's passport kind of thing. And it's essentially the same steps. Uh, CSO has a formalized web of trust, whereas the GPG or PGP Web of Trust is casual, informal. Um, and you'll find most people in CA Cert are also part of the GPG and PGP communities. So we'll see, hopefully, most of you after the break.